For more than 600 years, the undergraduates of Cambridge University who have satisfied their examiners have been presented by their college prelectors to the vice-chancellor to receive their degree. Today is another degree day. In the Senate House, as the candidates for a degree kneel before the vice-chancellor, they will hear the same 600-year-old Latin formula, octaritate mehi commissa, admito te et gradum baccalaurei in artibus, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. These men are now graduates of the university. Most of them will be leaving Cambridge for good to start a job in life. A few will stay on to continue their researches. But wherever they go, they will remember many things of their three years undergraduate life at Cambridge. Cambridge platform, that strange long single platform that serves both the up and down trains. Then Cambridge town, where the buses seem so menacingly big, and the streets, even the main street, so defiantly narrow, where the people share the streets with the buses, motor cars, horses and carts, and bicycles. Cambridge is the place in England to see bicycles, in ones and twos, or sometimes in hundreds. Cambridge, lying as it does in some of the most fertile land in the country, is an energetic, thriving market town. So it is natural that the marketplace should be the real centre of the town. On Saturdays, it is gay and lively with people, crowding along the many rows of stalls, buying fruit, vegetables, antiques, books, meat, in fact, almost anything. Cambridge is a very old town with many charms, but some of them have to be looked for, quiet, narrow little streets. Here and there, an old house or row of houses, seemingly ignoring the push of time. Lovely groups of little rooftops huddled away in unsuspected corners. If these were to disappear, Cambridge would lose one of its greatest charms. And the churches, large and small, are of beauty and interest. But for the undergraduate, Cambridge means the university and his college. Two independent but interdependent bodies which in their different ways contribute to his education. The university teaches and trains him in the libraries, museums, lecture rooms and laboratories and then finally gives him his degree in the Senate House. His college offers him a home where he lives, works and plays. This home he shares with men who are studying not only his own but other subjects as well. Anyone who has been to Cambridge will remember many things about the university and his college. The early morning walk across the court for a bath, and then, after breakfast, the start for the nine o'clock lecture. Shortly before the hour, sometimes very shortly, men begin to leave their colleges, down the staircases and into the courts. Singly, or in twos and threes, hurriedly or leisurely, some with and some without gowns, Science men don't wear gowns at work. The great trek starts to the university lecture halls and laboratories. The day's work is beginning. At this hour, every day of the week except Sunday, King's Parade and other streets in Cambridge are full of men and women on foot and bicycle. You only have to look round the many lecture rooms to realise the opportunities men and women have in Cambridge of learning their subjects. 
They have the rare good fortune and privilege of being taught and trained by world famous experts. If it is the physical sciences, there is the Cavendish Professor of Physics, Sir Lawrence Bragg. In this course of 24 lectures on physical optics, I'm going to talk about the interference and diffraction of light waves. I want to deal with such things as uh, fringe visibility and fringe formation, the diffraction of light passing through apertures or around obstacles, the analysis of spectra by gratings, the very important question of resolving power, formation of optical images, and the passage of light through doubly refracting and optically active media. The, the test of the success of any course is not so much what you people are able to repeat in an examination that you take at the end of the course, but what you're going to remember 10 years from now. Oh, there is Professor G.M. Trevelyan, the historian and master of Trinity. I now turn to the political aspect of the cabinet. We must trace its gradual evolution from a private meeting of men who were the king's servants only, as in the reign of Charles II, into a meeting of the king's servants who are also servants of the House of Commons. This change was not a part of the Revolution Settlement of 1689. That settlement had not taken its final form, which we may call the Hanoverian Constitution, until the modern cabinet had been forged on the anvil of time as the iron chain binding the executive to legislative and legislative to executive. Research work goes on endlessly in Cambridge, work which immediately or ultimately affects modern day problems. It may be investigating the habits of wireworms and the best ways of destroying them in the soil, or studying the mechanism by which an animal, such as a snake or a millipede, moves across a small wave bridge and recording the movements on a revolving drum. Research is traditional in Cambridge. In every laboratory, there is the most modern apparatus, spectrophotometers that can determine the concentration of pigments in solution, balances that can weigh something as light as the wing of the smallest insect, the electron microscope, which has a resolving power 40 times greater than any microscope using light, or the gigantic high voltage installation in the Cavendish laboratories that can generate a million volts. These are some of the scientific instruments which are almost terrifying in their powers of penetration and detection. Throughout the morning, undergraduates move from one lecture room to another, punctuated here and there by a visit to a cafe, a refresher in the morning's rush. But the work goes on, surveying in the fields by the River Cam at the back of the School of Engineering, or a drawing class in the engineering laboratories, or next door in the School of Architecture, hearing new ideas and developments in the design of modern houses and public buildings and their relation to town planning of the future. Not far away are groups of laboratories with plenty of opportunities for the student as well as the research worker. There, men with women from Newnham and Girton work side by side learning the proper scientific approach as well as gaining the necessary knowledge for their degrees.
The morning's work in the university ends at one o'clock. By then, the lecture rooms, the museums, and libraries are empty. The undergraduate leaves the university and returns to his college. In a way, he exchanges one life for another, another life no less important. He exchanges the bustle of the university buildings for the peace of the college cloisters and the quiet beauty of the college courts. It would be impossible for a man ever to forget the stillness of the second court of St. John's with its buildings of dull, plum-colored bricks, or the immense great court of Trinity, where Isaac Newton and Lord Byron lived and worked. The smaller courts of the smaller colleges, too, have their own particular charm and beauty. He will remember the many famous buildings in his own and other colleges, the Peepsian Library at Magdalen, the Fellows Building at Christ's, the Timbered President's Lodge at Queen's, the Wren Library at Trinity, and the Great Lawn at King's, with the Renaissance Clare, the Gothic Chapel, and the classical Gibbs Building. Even the River Cam, moving slowly along the backs of the colleges, has its meaning and exerts its influence. It is a part of Cambridge life. The college buildings, the college lawns, and the river together form one indivisible whole the banks. The banks of the Cam are an invitation to sit and work, read, and think. It is in this atmosphere that an undergraduate lives his three years at Cambridge. It is a kind of family life with centuries of tradition behind it. It is a life with opportunities for friendship and comradeship where one meets all types of men, where new ideas are formed and old ones discarded or strengthened, where there is leisure not to be idle, but to read, talk, work, and think for oneself. It's a life of contrast, with opportunity for quiet and opportunity for play. Discussion goes on endlessly in Cambridge. Cambridge life stimulates it. Everybody does it, dons and undergraduates alike. It is a common sight in summer to see two solitary figures pacing the great lawn at King's, two dons in deep discussion. There's also an easy informality between don and undergraduate when they meet by chance, as they often do, in the college courts. The war has played a big part in Cambridge life. Sir Will Spens, the master of Corpus Christi College, was appointed regional commissioner for East Anglia at the outbreak of war. Men coming to Cambridge, unless physically unfit, have to train for the Navy, Army, Air Force, and Home Guard. Every college has its own ARP services, manned by undergraduates, and they're very efficient. In wartime Cambridge, you'll often see the Provost of Kings showing overseas visitors to this country around his college, and afterwards lecturing to them informally on his favorite subject of Homer. Why does Greek poetry still matter? First, I think, because it is the poetry of freedom and of friendship. 3,000 years ago, Odysseus cried, what sort of people live in this country to which I have now come? Are they proud and arrogant and savage and unjust? Or are they friends to strangers, men of a God-fearing mind? Friends to strangers. To this day, Greece has only the one word for foreigner and guest. When evening comes, life in college is just as varied and just as interesting and important. 
it is a chance to finish some work in the quiet of one's own room before dinner in hall. Or an early evening visit to a tutor's room for a supervision, perhaps in modern languages. About this time, the chefs in the great college kitchens are preparing for dinner. Hundreds of undergraduates, as well as the fellows of the college, will be dining in hall. Hall at night is a ceremony as well as a meal. The ritual is unvarying and strictly formal. Concede ut elis salubriter attenum treaty, tibi debitum obsequim praestare valiamus per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. After dinner, the fellows retire to the combination room for wine and coffee. Of all the combination rooms in Cambridge, the loveliest is at St John's, a long, beautiful Elizabethan room lit entirely by candlelight. At Christ's, there's an interesting wine book recording the bets made between fellows of the college on various topics of the day. One faded entry tells of a presentation of wine at the time of the Battle of Waterloo. June the 22nd, 1815. Mr. Gilpin presented three bottles of claret in the combination room in honor of the Duke of Wellington's victory over Buonaparte in person. Every college has many societies of its own, and it is common to find groups of undergraduates in their tutor's rooms at night, reading a play, listening to music, discussing politics, friendly informal gatherings of men, willing and able to express their opinions on equal terms. Or there's the Amateur Dramatic Society. Its members do everything from painting the scenery to acting the parts and producing the plays. But the memories of evenings at Cambridge are mainly of college rooms. A few steps down a flight of stairs or across a corridor brings one to a friend's room for a drink and a discussion, often till the early hours of the morning, on work, sport, politics, religion, life. In fact, almost everything. Sometimes it's a quiet evening. Sometimes it isn't. Life is more gentle at Newnham and Girton, but parties go on there just the same, with discussions on the same problems. Cambridge is a great centre for music. The University Musical Society, under Dr Patrick Hadley, has a large orchestra and a choir of over 200. It has given many public performances of major works, some of them for the first time in this country.
Cambridge has a long tradition behind it and can give an undergraduate the benefits of 800 years of experience. The university offers him a way to knowledge. The college offers him a way of life. Something which is more intangible, often contradictory, always essentially English. It is a way of life where the formal and the informal harmonize, where men work for the future, but do not forget the past. It is a way of life which has given the world many of its greatest scientists, scholars, statesmen, and poets, and which made Isaac Newton an authority on the scriptures as well as the greatest mathematician of all time. Cambridge has seen many changes during its long history and will see many more. Some of the privileges will go, but one privilege will always remain, the privilege of being up at Cambridge. For Cambridge fits a man not only for the job in life, but for the job of life. Thank you.